Okay, hello everyone. I'm Emily. I'm the Zoom admin for this room. Uh, welcome to Speculative Poetry, Tips for Writing the Best Verse in the Verse. So the panelists uh, will accept questions um, at the end. And it, to ask a question, you can put it in the chat or we also have the Q&A feature. So please take advantage of that. Just a friendly reminder that the panel will end at 11.45, but you can continue the discussion in the Discord after panel chat. So thank you very much. And Jennifer, take it away. Great, thank you very much. I'm Jennifer Crow. I'm gonna be moderating. Um, I have written a lot of speculative poetry. It's been published in a bunch of different places. I also am an assistant editor at the latest incarnation of amazing stories. So I read the poetry slush. Um, next up, I think Akua. Oh, hi. Uh, my name's Akua Leslie Hope, and I'm speaking to you from the land, the ancestral land of the Anandawaga, also known as the Keepers of the Western Door. And it, this place is currently called Corning, New York. Um, I'm a creator, poet, writer. I appear in the very first anthology of Black science fiction called Dark Matter, but I'm more poet than short story writer. That's a challenge for me. So I'm delighted to be here to talk about poetry. I'm published in numerous poetry magazines and I've been in print in poetry since before your parents were born in 1974. <laughs> Um, next up, Valerie. <clears throat> Hi, I am Valerie Valdez. I am a speculative fiction writer, primarily a novelist. I have uh, two books out. First is Chilling Effect, second is Prime Deceptions. They're both space opera, but um, my first love is poetry. And I am published in Uncanny Magazine and uh, a couple of other places. I also completed a poetry thesis in college, strangely enough. And so here I am, despite my novels, I, I am I'm at heart a poet for my sins. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Wendy. Hi, I'm Wendy Van Camp. I'm also an author and a poet. Uh, my first book was a Jane Austen variation on her book Persuasion. And my second book is my Elgin nominated book, The Planets, which is a book of sci-fi coup poetry. And sci-fi coup is science fiction themed um, haiku. Um, I've been uh, publishing for quite a number of years. I, I don't have a lot of books out, but I certainly have a lot of poetry out on the net. I've uh, been publishing in magazines probably, oh gosh, at least a decade now, I guess. And um, I'm rather active on Medium. So if you'd like to read some of my poems afterwards, uh, you can find me there. Great. Thanks. OK, Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Hogenbrook. I'm here in uh, Binghamton, New York, uh, somewhere in between the actual Rubicon Museum and Ron Serling's uh, old childhood home. So uh, here for the hometown. Um, I've, uh, yeah, also a, a specific writer and uh, poet uh, published in uh, places like Liminality and uh, Abyss and Apex coming up. Um, a little bit newer to the game, uh, the uh, uh, Preston Sun Bulletin referred to me as other local author. So uh, very happy about that. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I uh, have been a poet for uh, most of my life, so uh, very happy to have a chance to talk about it. Excellent. Um, to start off with, what would you all say is a good working definition of speculative poetry? Anyone can jump in whenever. I say the poetry of possibilities. I've been defining mm -hmm. it a lot, a lot lately, and what I people to help them understand it, um, and, and I've shared this with Wendy, is a huge list of the possibilities that the speculative poetry umbrella holds. But I'll shut up there because that list goes on and on and on and on. Very extensive, yes. yes. <laughs> well, that's one of the great things about it. There's, there's so much space underneath there for everybody who wants to try something new. Yes. I'm often astounded by the uh, the range of what is considered speculative poetry. I mean, I myself am more considered an astro poet, which means I tend to write about scientific concepts or um, uh, things of the near future uh, related to technology. Um, but it can run the gamut. It it can be war. It can be anything. And and 
that's what's really great about it. It's true. Yeah, I definitely Brian? agree with what's been said. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Brian. No, I was, I was, <laughs> we was just going to say that uh, I, I, I take a slightly more slipstream approach in trying to uh, poke and prod at uh, the things that could be possible and the things that are uh, absolutely impossible. Uh, you know, all those uh, dark and scary things just outside the, the little circle of what's actually known and real. Valerie? Yeah, still, still can, uh, completely agreeing with everyone else. I, I think I also, um, you can you can get very literal about it and say, well, it has to have speculative elements, but I, I don't think that's absolutely necessary. It helps clearly delineate it. But um, I also do think that it, it's about possibility and in sometimes it can be useful for literalizing things that would be treated strictly as metaphorical in other poems mm. um, in, in the way of, you know, okay, these are not metaphorical or figurative dragons, they're literal dragons. They're not metaphorical or figurative humans. Exactly, exactly. And so I think that's one of the um, potentials that speculative poetry has that uh, you, you lose from non-speculative poetry, though it's not a requirement. It, it's interesting that I see a lot of overlap in poetry markets that tend to see themselves as more mainstream. I think more so than fiction, they're open to people doing things that are a little bit strange, a little bit um, weird, and maybe being willing to look at things metaphorically that we might be phrasing as more literally. Well, but, well, maybe this is just me, but I, I always thought poets already were a little bit weird, so everybody <laughs> just sort of accepted that. Well, that's true too. So um, let's talk for a minute about inspiration because that's the thing everybody wants to know from writers. So where do you go for your poetic inspiration? Well, I can jump in. Oh, I'm sorry, Akua. No, um, no, go ahead, Wendy. And then oh, I'm okay. Uh, well, I actually have a system in place. I, I tend to write my poetry fairly quickly, which some people have told me that's a little strange, but I have a system in place, and I think that might be why I can bang out several poems like in an afternoon. What I do is I have a tickler system of magazines that I use, and I use these for books and short stories, too. Um, they're mainly scientific journals, and um, what I do is I comb through for various ideas that I think I will incorporate into my poetry. Uh, the latest poem I just published is about the SpaceX uh, launch, and uh, what I did is I watched the launch, and I got the emotional impact of it that I use, but I also went back and I researched um, articles about the launch, and what the perspective was from people on the outside and from journalists. And I used all this together uh, before I wrote the poem. And so it was well researched. I had all the uh, scientific facts in place. Um, and, but then I also stepped back and I did more the, um, more the emotional impact too. So that it wasn't writing from just my perspective, but I, I try to write more from a um, we perspective. And I, I find my poetry seems to be a little has a little more oomph when I do that. But I can throw together poetry very quickly because of the system. And especially with my sci-fi coup, I usually in the afternoon I'll do four or five because I select one topic and then I write several poems on that. But we'll go into more on that later. I don't want to hog the panel here. <laughs> uh, so I'll go next. Uh, I started out, I blurted out everywhere. For me, it comes from everywhere. But when I think about the things that are under the um, speculative poetry umbrella, I, I employ a lot of them. Um, I do some mythology. I've written about anime. Um, I space. The, the last set of sci-fi coup I did was also sort of on demand. Um, because there's been a call for Halloween work. So I just sat and thought about Halloween. And our current experience has been very Halloweenish. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot that was imagined, um, prophesied, predicted that we are living through. So daily life is now full of opportunity to um, 
to explore, explore, I started to say explode. I wanted to, I wanted to say encode, not explode, but gee, that's, you know, Freudian slip. Um, yeah. <laughs> to encode and, and, and explore right now. So, so many sources of inspiration. And, and I'll say this, um, a friend of mine gave me this thing that looks like a spaceship and it grows herbs. And so suddenly I found myself writing um, sci-fi coup about, you know, alien plants like that. You draw it from everywhere and put things together that wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily think would go together. Exactly. So Valerie, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with everywhere. Um, I, I'm a much slower poet these days because I have to focus so much of my attention on, on novel writing that um, it, I tend to not have a ton left over. And so more than with Wendy, which is uh, the approach that I favor for most writing in general, I, I tend to um, just let things come to me now more than I ever did. And when the inspiration strikes, I kind of just chase it down uh, as quickly as possible so I don't lose it. But usually it will come from just, you know, I, I interact with something on Twitter, I read something, I see something outside, uh, something catches my attention basically, and um, sort of lodges itself like an image in my head, and then I have to write it down. And then from there, it will either keep growing and I can uh, cultivate it a little bit, or I just kind of let it stay in the text file. I have a file that I use for ideas. And I just, anytime something happens, I put it in the file. And that way, worst case scenario, I can always go back to the file later if I need something to inspire me in the moment when I have to produce, because <laughs> sometimes you have to produce, you don't have a choice, you don't have to wait, you, you can't wait around for things. Um, and so I like having that idea file, but sometimes it just won't let me go. And so I will just be on that for, you know, a couple of days or longer, um, refining and adding and, and pruning and whatever needs doing for the for the poem to take form. But everywhere, TV shows, things I read, <laughs> things I see in the news, online, on Facebook, random articles that pop up, you know, it, it, you can get inspiration from virtually anything. It just has to be something that either, you know, as was stated, it, it, it's juxtaposed with something in just the right way that it gives you a, a, an avenue for contemplation or it, it just, you get the hit with an image and you can't let it go. Having a, a file is a great idea. I do that myself because there's so many things that crop up and I used to think I would remember it later and I never remember it later. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I got to write it down. And so I have this whole list of things and sometimes I'm like, I want to write a poem. And then I look at my list and something always jumps out that I have to write a poem about. So that works really well. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk about Akua, a couple of days ago, you posted um, some mask artwork that you did. And I oh. thought that was really fascinating. And I love the, how you explained the, the symbolism of the different parts. So I wanted to talk about, for all of us, do you have something else you do creatively besides writing? And if so, how does that inform your writing and, and your poetry? Wow. I, I could go. I, 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 yes, please. <laughs> it, well, no, because when you went to all of it, can I step back for a moment? Because sure. I'm, because I, I didn't look at the chat, but I'm believing the audience um, may also be looking for tips. And, and both you and uh, Valerie said something that I wanted to underline for people, which was, uh -huh. um, uh, and also to Wendy's idea of, of systemati systematizing it. So I just wanted to throw this out there. One of the things I do for the, to respond to the everywhere is my house has notepads everywhere where <laughs> I pause. And, and so just to get in, down into the weeds just for a moment, because you know other panelists have said this, Enable yourself to be able to capture when that idea occurs. So have whatever your favorite instrument of recording is. I, for me, that's pens and pads. So there is a pen and pad in the kitchen. There's definitely pens and pads 
um, in the living room and in the bedroom. Your places may be other, but think of where you are that you pause that this inspiration strikes. And it, I, I, I'm hesitant and almost stuttering because I ran into so many young poets who their phone is that device. So the whole idea of pen and pad, <laughs> I, I feel almost antiquated saying, yeah, you, need, you should have a notebook or you should have a pen there. Um, but I just wanted to mention that, that you can aid and abet your creativity by just making sure you have tools at hand. Okay. Very and good point. So th then I'll speak to your question. Um, I'm, I find when I am stuck in one area of endeavor, I move to another and that I'm um, sourced and re-energized by making with my hands when the mind is tired or unwilling or misbehaving in terms of putting words on the page. So that, that's how it feeds me. So the, cre the physical creating feeds the more intellectual creating. Although th that becomes physical too, because like I said, I'm old fashioned. And I still use, a, I have a favorite pen, which with a you know, special point that flows really fast and a favorite kind of piece of paper. But um, still that other making helps. Yeah, I, I think we, we talk sometimes as writers about ritual and you know, you have to have your cup of coffee before you start or something. <laughs> And, and, you know, we're warned that that's kind of dangerous, which I agree. But as you say, having something physically you can do with your hands, I, I think that energizes a part of the brain that we also use with our writing. I'm a crocheter, so, you know, because oh, I don't draw. But yes, me too. Me too. Are. Cool, cool. Oh, that's adorable. Uh, I do amigurumi. I have 130 plus patterns on Ravelry. Check me out there also, people. I will do that. So, so yeah, having that, having other things to do, I think, for me, really energizes. What about the rest of you? Well, I draw, actually. I'm a, I illustrate my poetry, but I oh, cool. just do... They're I, gorgeous people. Check it out. She's on oh, Etsy. Yes, I am. I now sell them as art prints on Etsy. Uh, but they just started out as just a, a way to put my poetry up on my blog. So I would do just a simple line sketch. And, you know, I look at them and they're just so simple. I'm almost embarrassed to put them out. They're lovely. like them. So I, now I sell them as art prints and people buy them. So what the heck? But um one day a magazine uh, editor saw them and said, you know, I need an illustrator. Could I use your um, blog posts, um, the art on your blog in my magazine? And now I've been publishing with her for eight or nine years. Every year I send her a, a, whatever I, I graded for this year, she uh, publishes now. And then a few years after that, I started putting them up in the art shows at various sci-fi cons because, of course, since I write astro poetry, they're all science fiction and theme or scientific and theme. Um, evidently, my art is hanging on the walls at JPL and NASA. Where? Oh, wonderful! Their aunts and uncles go, "Oh, that's about that planet." My my uh, nephew uh, is working at NASA on that planet, so they probably. Uh, you know, that's an old uh, crafter trick, evidently. <laughs> you know, I've been an artist for, uh, you know, 25 plus years. I, I, but I used to be a artisan jeweler, and I used to come to sci-fi conventions with my science fiction and Celtic themed jewelry. Although I don't do it as much as I used to because now I'm an author and I come and I do my books and poetry and things like that. But, you know, there's a Let's just say there's a few shows. If I don't show up with my earrings, uh, the women are going to come after me with wet noodles. And <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I, I I just want to get back to the sketching part because I I actually schedule in one art day a week. So one day I I just know that I'm going to create art that day, and I have my studio. I set it up with all my art tools. My drawing board is right here, as a matter of fact. And I just put everything out and I picked out like a list of poems that I know I want to sketch at some point. 
Um, right mm -hmm. now I'm working on a selection of poetry from my um, book, The Planets. And slowly but surely I'm illustrating um, a selection, maybe a dozen of them that I'm gonna just put out on the net and uh, eventually maybe even turn into a little chat book of some kind. But it's uh, nice to have some place to go and do something with your hands as uh, Akua said, or Jennifer with your knitting or uh, sorry, crocheting. But um, it, it kind of engages a different part of your brain mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it gives you a relaxation in that writing session. I, I honestly think it's like two different parts of the brain. Both of them are equally creative Yes. And if you exercise one or the other, it seems to help. So yes. uh, I, I think most writers should pick up something, uh, I, whatever it is that you enjoy. So what can I say? Great. So, so what about you, Valerie? Alas, I, I video game. <laughs> <laughs> it uses my hands in, in some ways, but it's not a crafting thing. Um, I, <laughs> there, a little bit of Animal Crossing can be fun because there is some uh, construction, I guess you could say, associated with that, some creativity, some design in terms of uh, layout of the village and, and how you can arrange things. But um, my son does Minecraft and that's a whole other level of that sort of creativity. But uh, more and more these days, I, I have, well, I have two small children and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and deadlines. And so unfortunately, um, Wendy's got the right of it though. The right thing to do is to schedule it in so that you know you have that dedicated time and you know that you can turn to that time for whatever you may want to do so yeah dedicated downtime is a, is a good thing to have for yourself because you know whatever you do in it having having that space is a valuable thing and I can definitely say as the mother of some children that are busy yeah pencil in some time for yourself mm -hmm. Brian you are tailing in at the end here. Yeah. What do you do? Uh, well, I, I wish I had other talents. Uh, <laughs> and I, I feel a little bit envious at the ability to draw or, uh, or craft. But, um, uh, you know, as, as someone who uh, has to uh, fit in writing amidst uh, a day job that uh, demands more and more time, I uh, mm. usually find myself uh, going on uh, longer walks or doing yoga to kind of put aside everything, you know, all sort of mental distractions. And uh, I don't do, you know, so letting myself be open, I think, to things that aren't the daily pressures. And that's what helps to relieve any of the pressures, if you will, or the stresses that might get in the way of, uh, you know, the normal writing process. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, not, not that I don't you know, try my hand at, you know, small cooking experiments or <laughs> things around the house, but uh, uh, sometimes <laughs> those don't go as well as I would hope. And I end up going back to, uh, Okay. Okay. Yes. Per the chat, I, I do. Uh, I do brew beer. I do beer. Uh, brew uh, wine, but um, uh, those don't directly feed into the writing process. Uh, those are more of a byproduct of it. I was going to say that directly feeds into my writing process. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think. I think sometimes too, we tend to to denigrate our own skills and practices over other people's. And I apologize there's a tragic muffler shortage in my neighborhood. And so occasionally you will hear very loud vehicles <laughs> and I cannot do anything about them. Um, but yeah, you know, don't, don't put down the things that you do that are fun or useful because it, there's, no, there's no rule about what you have to be doing mm -hmm. in order, you know, cooking is creative, making beer is creative. There obviously yes. are people on this panel that value that skill. <laughs> Oh, yes. So, you know, don't put that down. You want to expand into mead, I'm here for you. <laughs> mead. We'll talk, we'll talk. Yes. So let's talk a minute about, you know, switching between fiction, writing, and poetry. I think most of us do some of both. So why don't we tell the people that are listening to us, what's the value of learning how to write poetry if you primarily want to focus on fiction? Because, I mean, my personal opinion is there is value in learning to write poetry and, and developing those skills, even if you only want to publish fiction. But, you know, let, let's sell poetry to, to our listeners. 
I'm going to fold in the chat a little bit because there's a question about what role does visualization play in your writing. And I will say oh, yes. that I think that visualization is extremely useful for poetry. I think you, you can have, you know, kind of more abstract idea poetry. You can have much more concrete, concrete uh, imagistic poetry. And I think that um, learning the sort of tools of poetic language can be extremely useful when you're translating that to prose tools of, you know, metaphor and simile and allegory and, and analogy, uh, all of these kinds of how, how you juxtapose two images to create a third idea, which in film you would call montage. Stuff like that is extremely useful, I think, in, in translating to fiction. Typically in poetry, you also learn an economy of language that is very useful when you translate it to prose. And uh, you can get a lot, you can get away with a lot more in a novel than you can get away with in a short story. And you can get away with more in a short story than you can in a poem. And so uh, the, the poem is in, in some senses, I think, um, and I'm, my word's not gospel, obviously, but it is sort of the most refined form. It's, it's the most condensed form. And, uh, and in my case, it's often the most image heavy form. And I think that, that uh, the ability to visualize, the ability to try to translate um, what I see, what I smell, what I experience through my senses into poetic language and imbue it with the kinds of meanings that uh, I received also when I was sort of receiving that input or mm -hmm. the meanings that I feel that, that those images can carry, I guess. Um, I think that's really helpful uh, in, in prose as well as in poetry. Uh, it, it allows you to have that kind of um, that kind of concrete thinking, that kind of uh, sensory thinking that helps bring readers into the thing that you are trying to describe. Um, there's the, the poem, um, Ars Poetica, uh, a poem should not mean but be. And I think that that notion can translate also very well into fiction where you're not merely trying to replicate something, you're trying to give it that verisimilitude and then poetic language and technique can really help with that. That's a good point. For, for my, oh, sorry, who was going next? I was just going to say, no, I was going to speak to the question which, which talked about, I can't visualize. And I want to share that I rarely, if ever, visualize. Um, so I wanted to say that there are many, as we now have come to know um, as a culture, there are many ways of learning. And so there are many ways, again, of expression. And there are many ways in which you can write a poem. And, and the inability to visualize, I, I, don't, I don't conceive in a visual way, per se, though I love the visual. I can make the visual and I make the visual and I work in handmade paper and I make sculpture and I make art and I use paint, but I, do, I too don't visualize. So I'm gonna share that tip with you. Your path of learning, expression, receiving can be different and therefore your poetry would be different. And so my concern is sometimes we're working with these internal definitions that are limiting and constraining and you need to let them go. If you want to do it, do it. And, and then, and also please keep seeking because it's not necessarily a visual process, even in creating a visual product. I'm here to testify. And because the piece that Jennifer's talking about, that's in, ex in exhibit. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, but to know that someone received the communication, someone re received the artistic communication. So I know that to, to that extent, I am successful in rendering visually. But if you, if you said to me, what do you visualize? It, no, I don't either. But I, I hear stories or I feel stories and music is very important to me. That's another way it works through me. Sound is what I use in, in creating. So um, dear questioner, I, I, I can't see anymore who asked it. Um, it's not necessarily about visualizing in terms of writing. So That's I just, a good point. I, I'm much more auditory myself. I, I tend to hear the, the music of, the words and how they fit together 
rather than necessarily seeing something. I, I might be out for a walk and see something beautiful and think I want to incorporate that in a poem, but I'm not necessarily envisioning a, a physical exactly. experience, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I, That's I what I was trying to say. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm done. I, I was going to say on the other side of the coin, um, I, I often take a reference photo if I can, because you know, mm -hmm. I'll know that I have a feeling in the moment. Uh, but as time passes, that image will get a little bit blurrier up here, even if I can hold on to it. And uh, having something to look at, even if you're not visualizing it directly anymore, can help to uh, restore that sensation or feeling that you're thinking of at the time and can help to uh, translate into what you're trying to put down on the page. Yep. Um, I, I have a lot of bookmarks on Twitter because there's a lot of great artists or people will, po will post interesting old paintings. And so whatever one comes up that I find interesting, I bookmark it so I can go back to it later and see if there's some thing in there that wants to come out to me. I use um, Pinterest is for that as well, so. Yes, Pinterest is another good Pinterest. <laughs> oh yes. That's, that's a hole you can fall in and never get out. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I think a good thing to, to, to think of is that you need to discover what works for you and then make use of that to the best of your ability. Every, every person has their own process, which is one of the things I love about these panels because, you know, there's always some new idea and I'm like, I could try that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but it's fun to try. Yeah, it's and tools tools to add to your toolbox. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we've we've got about fifteen more minutes. So if you have questions, now would be a good time to ask because we're running we're going to be running low on time. In the meantime, um, one thing I wanted to talk about because I I think I'm not the only one who's been thinking about this a lot lately. What can we do to make our poetry, our, our work relevant in a time when things are seem very chaotic. You know, how do we how do we find a point in our work and a value to what we do? I I would like to think that there is a value in art that's it's intrinsic. To everything. It's intrinsic. Yeah. I, I you know I wanna I hear I hear that the desire and the need, or maybe even, you know, the questioning, but people need, in, in the same way that Brian talked about, like doing yoga or meditating and having some calming practice, there needs to be a place for us to go for our minds and our imaginations to go in a time when reality is denying so much of who we are. So, mm -hmm when you talk about the, the, rel the relevance is, in, to my mind, intrinsic. If the work is honest and imbued with that sense of possibility to your, the best of your ability, then you've given your community what it needs. You know, it, it's not always about there needs to be a nail that you need to hammer in here. Um, right. So, you know, and I'm not saying that to absolve anybody of the responsibility as a world citizen to make this world a better, more holistic, more involved, more inclusive, more neurodiverse, more diverse, um, less a less forgetful place. Um, I'm learning. I I now do a land acknowledgement. Because Con Zealand, this is going to bring tears to my eyes. Con Zealand, which is another convention that was, it was the World Convention held earlier this year. I heard person after person do a land acknowledgement. And I was like, oh my God, I'm living here and I don't know about the here that I am. And, and so, and, and I offer that just as an example of just doing what they were doing. It's a science fiction convention. And suddenly I've learned other people do land acknowledgements. I didn't even know there was a name for doing this. And I've now incorporated that into my practice. So our speculative creation can refract 
reflect and shine light on the here and now and what we need here and now. And that's important. Yes. Well, we have to remember that what we do is important. And, and we have to work to, to honor that, I think. Yes. We have a couple of questions and I don't want to pass them up. Um, people are asking about what online resources or um, paper journals are, are good resources to use. Um, what websites science, are helpful? The science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association is a great starting place, uh, not only because I'm a member, but because it has markets, it has contests, it is the um, Organization of Note for Speculative Poetry. So that's a good place to begin. And then another place that's new to me is called Grinder. For yeah, submission Grinder, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you're looking specifically for sci-fi, you put in sci-fi and you find it, or poetry or fiction. But for speculative poetry, the SFPA uh, is the place to begin for, for markets, for information. And they have a newsletter uh, that you don't have to be a member to get called the SPEC. It's brand new and it's fun. Those are, those are good resources. Um, along with Submission Grinder, I use Duotrope, which is similar. And um, that's a good resource for finding markets. Um, they, they can break things down for you so you can more specifically send poetry out. Um, there are a lot of, of good, um, there's, a, there's a good community on Twitter and you know you have to to search around and find people but i found that there's a lot of of supportive and helpful folks that that will give you good information um what else um valerie wendy brian what do you use well i'm actually thinking as a resource as to generate things i i actually like blogs maybe i'm a little old-fashioned that way but down through the years i've developed a list of blog i have maybe four or five hundred of them that i comb through and read no 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 seriously i use feedly i have them all organized by topic and occasionally i i go through and i scan them i use them as for my blog posts i do a top 10 article um twice a month and i use it for that but i also use it to read and get ideas and but it's it's an organic thing that i've developed i've looked at each blogger if I like the quality of their writing, um, what sort of topics that they do, and it becomes part of my resources um, that I use in the creative process. Um, this is not something you can just press a button and there it is. You have to organically create it yourself. But when you do it that way, it becomes a unique resource to you and helps define your own poetic or just simply writing voice. Um, so I. I don't really like the idea of let's just press a button and here's a resource that anyone in the world can tap. I prefer to create things that are unique to me that I use that nobody else has. And that way it helps me create things that are unique to me. And anybody can do it. It's not rocket science, but it does take time and it takes a, maybe a discipline to curate. Um, but once you have these things set up, they're, they become invaluable as a resource for writing. And I, you know, it's free. It doesn't cost anything, but it does cost a little bit of time and maybe a little bit of knowing how to organize things. And you don't have to, use, I use Feedly for this one, but you could set up things like this in Notion or you could set it up in Evernote, um, but for resources that are unique to you. And I, I would urge you to create things that are for your use only that are unique to you to help you develop as a unique artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good points. I would just add that um, uh, in addition to, to all those things, um, speculative poetry, I mean, it's been around uh, before there was speculative fiction, right? It's been around for at least a thousand years if you look at it. So um, there's a, a website that uh, Theodora Goss put together called uh, Poems of the Fantastic and the Macabre that uh, covers the full history of spec poetry 
you know, mm -hmm. Dave, you know, going, you know, tw in the direction of Beowulf and similar, uh, mm -hmm. that if you want a, a history lesson, <laughs> Or, you know, kind of a foundational point of, uh, you know, many, many people exploring a whole bunch of different types of spec po, um, that may, may not be a bad place to go. And I see, of course, that uh, links to all these things have appeared in the chat. Uh, they're also going into the Discord, so uh, they'll be there for you uh, when you need them. Great. Thanks. Valerie? Pretty much everyone's covered the ones that I would have said, so. <laughs> somebody, somebody asked about magazines, and I think in the sense of where do we send poetry to? <laughs> um, there are a lot of great markets. One thing I love about the speculative poetry market right now is that you can, you can go from, you know, straight up Lovecrafty and weird with tentacles to something very, very subtle and slipstream and there's a place for it. You know, you, you work and you, and you learn to craft things and, and you know, when you've got a good poem, you will find a home for it because there's something out there for everybody. Um, some of my favorites are Uncanny, which a couple other people have mentioned. They're a great place. Um, Liminality, which Brian mentioned. Um, Strange Horizons has been doing a, a wide variety of poems, you know, a lot of, of different cultures and viewpoints for a long, long time. Um, Analog and Asimov's published poetry. So, you know, if you want to write Poems about planets, like em like um, Emily does. Oh, Wendy, Wendy sorry, <laughs> Wendy, as Wendy does. You know, there's places for that. Um, I to know. the telescope, mm -hmm. sci fi yeah. coup est, mm -hmm. um, silver blade, and 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 I just want to say that it does not always have to be. Depending on your poem, it doesn't have to necessarily be a genre magazine. Send mm -hmm. it where people publish poetry. You know, with my astro poetry, that's certainly, there's a huge market of uh, scientific journals that would take my mm -hmm. site through. So, so, I mean, I, I, any, any poem I've written is published, basically, but not necessarily in the quote-unquote pro mags that most uh, sci-fi uh, writers look for. Um, I, I've found uh, smaller magazines that have a huge distribution. And so even though I don't get a lot of money through the magazine itself, my, I'm getting a lot of eyeballs. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually everything will make money because of the, the system I've set up for my poetry. Um, I have so many reprint markets that will pay me as well. So everything goes to that. And eventually too, it becomes artwork. So that's, that's actually better than the, <laughs> Than the actual publishing, but um, but yeah, don't limit yourself to just mm -hmm. the 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 mm -hmm. big magazines that we all seem to be on you know, that are getting thousands of uh, queries every uh, every uh, day. You want to look around because there's a lot out there that you can put your work into that would be a benefit to you. So don't limit yourself. Just open your eyes and have a look. All right, we've got about two minutes left. So if anyone has any final thoughts. Practice, mm -hmm. make it perfect to, be, to become a writer, write and read. Um, yeah. reading, reading is as critical as writing in becoming a writer. And you can find five minutes every day to do it every day. So please, if you want to, please, Please do it. We need more. We need more of ourselves. We welcome more of ourselves. And I would suggest attending open mic poetry and seeking out poetry readings from people who are award winners or poet laureates and just mm -hmm. sitting back and listening and absorbing what they are doing. And a lot of it will help inform you on where you may want to go in the direction of poetry you want to do in the future. But, but listen, I, you know, I, it's funny. I don't read a lot of poetry, but I do listen to a lot of poetry in that way. And um, I just find it really beneficial. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to this panel. We really appreciate it. And uh, I think I've been inspired. I don't know about the rest of you, but we should probably call it quits now so they can get things ready for the next. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone.